Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Biojo's Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well and are all set for your upcoming exam, which is scheduled. Uh, a couple of announcements also that I'll be making uh, through the course of this particular session. But very quickly, let's review two important topics. Um, first, very important and scoring unit that you are having is the unit on literary criticism. Uh, so more often than not, I think a lot of times we actually uh, forget about this unit and the other is fiction. So there are some very interesting concepts that we'll be covering. Uh, there will be some very interesting points that we'll be talking about through the course of this particular lecture. So let us very, very quickly get started uh, with today's session. I'm just cross-checking whether you're able to hear me or not. Uh, perfect. I hope the voice is audible. Yeah, the voice is audible. Perfect. All right. So let's let's quickly dive into let's very, very quickly get started uh, with today's session that we are having today, we will be reviewing two important topics. Okay, uh, we will be looking at uh, two primary topics all together. One second, I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, so uh, the, these are a little scoring uh, units all together. I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, let me just share my screen very, very quickly so that all of you would be able to see it properly. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much, Deepak. That's such a sweet message to actually start today's session with. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Aziz, Rupesh, Mosmi, Rajdeep, Vijalakshmi, Komal, Kushi, Menika, uh, Saliha, Komal, Liji, Kaberi, Akriti, Kriti, Mamta. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I hope all of you are all set, pepped up and, you know, motivated for your upcoming exams. I'm going to be quickly sharing my screen with all of you. So let me know if you're able to see it. So two topics. Topics we'll be revising. Uh, there'll be two quick topics that we'll be reviewing. There'll be two important topics that I'll be uh, covering. One is literary criticism. Let's very quickly review literary criticism because it's actually one of the very scoring units that you're having, right? Literary criticism becomes like a very, very scoring unit overall in your exams for your examination perspective. And we'll also be looking at some very important questions from fiction. Okay, so both fiction as well as uh, Akriti, let's 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 definitely first one by one take a, a quick revision tour of these two topics, right? And tomorrow again, I'll be meeting all of you. So maybe over there we can cover uh, a little bit of literary criticism and cultural studies along with English in India. Okay, uh, so that is certainly something that we can actually look at. Uh, that's something that we can do. Okay, uh, so let us very very quickly get started. I am having some questions for all of you. Just give me one second. I'm actually not able to change it. One second, just give me one second. One minute. I'm just going to be resharing this. One second, I want literary criticism and post questions on literary criticism. We'll first be looking at questions on literary criticism and post that we will be looking at pleasure, pleasure. Just give me one second, everyone. I'm just trying to reconnect. It's just going to be really taking like 30 seconds, not more than that. Okay, uh, here we go with the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so there you go. All right, I think now you'll be able to see that. Just quickly share it again. Yeah, I think now it's going to be visible and I'll be able to shift it as well. So uh, this is uh, where we are, we, we are starting today's class with, right? This is where we're starting today's class with. What is the main theme of the poem to a mouse by Robert Burns? What is the most important theme that we're able to see? Nice, nice, Aziz. Congratulations. So good to hear that you cleared the West Bengal set exam. <clears throat> That's real good news.
Okay, so let's see how many of you are able to back the right answer over here. What is the correct answer? A lot of you have answered it. A lot of you have answered it. So it's basically, what is the main theme of the poem to a mouse by Robert Burns? It's the sorrow for animals' plight. It's talking about animals' plight altogether, the suffering part. Now, animal studies has also become a very important part. And what are you able to see? You're able to see a lot of these writings, a lot of these works are appearing. They are very critical from your examination perspective as well. And animal studies is a very beautiful range. Um, you know, it's offering a great insight. A lot of people have started looking at it uh, in greater detail altogether. So you all should be aware about it. You all must be uh, aware about these aspects also. So what are you able to see? You're able to see that here by Robert Burns, he's primarily talking about the sufferings that animals have to undergo. It is talking about the suffering, the plights of uh, the plight of the animals. So that is something which is primarily being discussed over here in this particular work, right? So to a mouse by Robert Burns, what is it discussing? It is discussing about sorrows for animals plight, right? The sorrows for animals plight, that is something which is being discussed, right? that is a primary agenda over here it was written in 1785 uh, by robert burns he is coming in scottish writings altogether and what are you able to see uh, how the poet is destroying the house of mouse and realizes that you know how humans are so a lot of times what are all these mosquito repellents hit etc how have we decided that they don't have a life or they don't have an existence altogether so animal studies is now becoming another key area especially because you know now uh, to combat in urban life loneliness is there and how are people fighting against loneliness by having pet animals the pet industry has drastically increased so is it that animals are always people who are going to be tamed is that uh, is that what uh, designation you're giving to animals so robert burns in to a mouse is actually talking about the suffering the pain altogether which animals actually have to undergo so that is something which is being discussed in greater insights there's another question for all of you that is coming in. Let's just move on to the other question. What poem did Thomas Gray write on the Celtic Revival? What poem did Thomas Gray write on the Celtic Revival? I'm so sorry. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So what poem is being written on the Celtic Revival? What poem is being written on the Celtic Revival? Absolutely right. The Bard is being written. The Bard is being written on the Celtic Revival. It is talking about the Gaelic theme. Celtic Revival was a very important component of your Irish writings also. And here, what are we able to see? Here we are able to see that Gray is writing the Bard. Gray is writing the Bard. Gray is writing the Bard, which is based on the theme of Celtic Revival. Okay. It is primarily dealing with the theme of the Celtic Revival. A lot of these uh, transitional poets are important. Uh, so whenever we we are looking at Gray, Goldsmith, Johnson. They are also considered to be transitional poets. These transitional poets are paving way from your Augustan poetry to Romantic Age poetry. There are certain commonalities. They're talking about common people altogether. That is what you're able to see largely. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Okay, moving on to the next question that we are having. The next question, in which edition of the Lyrical Ballets was the first one to have the preface by Wordsworth? Which had the preface to Wordsworth? Which edition had the preface to Wordsworth? <coughs> good morning. Good, oh, sorry, good evening. I read good morning. Right. Let's see. Let's see. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. 1800. So when first time the lyrical ballets had come, what we were able to see is we were able to look at how Wordsworth was not at all. Wordsworth was not at all happy to look at the popularity that Coldridge had got. I'm so sorry. I'm taking a lozenge because my, my throat is actually aching a little bit. And there are tons and tons of questions and tons and tons of revision pointers that we've collated via this particular deck. 
so i just wanted to bring all of those uh, to you so 1800 is absolutely the right answer so uh, the addition that is having the preface by wordsworth is the 1800 addition right that is the 1800 addition altogether so here you have to keep in mind a couple of pointers i'll just hide myself in case you want to see it properly but please remember about the brief advertisement which was also there and how overall this work changed the way uh, poetry was being written right ordinary language ordinary men being used over here that is something that the poem is trying to actually convey who viewed wordsworth saudi coleridge as representatives of a sect of as a sect of poets dissenters from the established system in poetry and criticism who constituted the most formidable conspiracy against sound judgment a sound judgment in matters political in matters political what is the right answer here what becomes the correct answer who viewed wordsworth absolutely right absolutely right francis jeffrey absolutely correct very good aftara aziz everybody has got it right so uh, all these all these terminologies that are being used cockney school of poetry satanic school of poetry your lake school of poets these are all terms or uh, which are coming under your category of romantic criticism they are all coming under the category of romantic criticism and francis jeffrey is the one who's calling them as lake poets they're calling them as lake poets right the lake poets over there that is a term that jeffrey is using look at this this is a really simple question <laughs> this is again very very simple not that difficult at all not that complicated if you are able to understand it properly you will be able to answer it correctly you have to match the poems with the poet right the poets and the poem absolutely right absolutely right so william blake right william blake so when, when we are looking at the uh, you know how blake is writing the lamb blake is writing the lamb blake is writing the lamb st coleridge st coleridge is a person who is associated with the work very famously called as dejection and ode right dejection and ode wordsworth i hope everybody remembers wordsworth is writing daffodils and robert southey is writing john of arc robert uh, robert southey is writing john of arc that is a work that robert southey he has written so dejection and ode was a reply to william wordsworth's resolution and independence please remember that and here we are able to see that you know coleridge expresses his idea john of arc is again saudi's way to talk about history politics and how he was saying that you know christian practices were largely superstitious in nature that is what he predominantly was trying to discuss right that is something that he was primarily trying to talk about okay let's move on to the next question what is being described by wordsworth in the following lines from his poem the thorn so what is it that is being described by wordsworth in the following lines <clears throat> what is it that we are able to see that wordsworth is describing <laughs> i'm so sorry what is being described by wordsworth i've measured it from side to side it's 3 feet long and 2 feet wide absolutely right it's the infant's grave it's the infant's grave right i've measured it from side to side it's 3 feet long feet long and 2 feet wide it's the infant's grave it's the infant's grave right it's the baby that we're talking about and this poem is telling you about martha ray she lost her baby and how you were able to see that you know it's trying to background overall how martha abandoned by her really really sad because she's also lost the uh, child all together and that is the grave of the child right that is the grave of the child that you are able to look at okay moving on to the next question which of the following poets does william hazlitt call don quixote like in his essay my first acquaintance with poets in his essay my first acquaintance with poets which of the following poets does william hazlitt called don quixote like he is calling don quixote like richi richi uh, richa i think when bachcha i am scrolling up no that may be uh, the reason 
no worries nikita that's perfectly all right you don't have to recollect anything just give it your best shot absolutely right so uh, you know uh, william wordsworth is being called as don quixote like don quixote like in his essay my first acquaintance with poets all together so we are able to see that you know wordsworth coleridge both of them are being considered and wordsworth is being described as don quixote like right he is having knowledge but he is also having egotism he is having knowledge but he is also having egotism altogether right so that is the reason he is don quixote like that is the reason he is don quixote like so wordsworth is being described as a person who is don quixote like wordsworth is being considered as a person who is don quixote like okay um see the idea in literary criticism is to understand you have to do classical criticism when you're looking at classical criticism look at classical writers also once when you've completed classical criticism then come to renaissance criticism right uh, even before that you have your uh, so classical criticism will have greek criticism as well as roman criticism so horace longinus everything will be covered post that you have your renaissance criticism where george putenham philip sidney everyone's coming post that you graduate a little and you go on to looking at uh, you know how a 17th century criticism is uh, evolving dryden is coming then after that johnson comes in and finally you are having the criticism that is being postulated by the romantics so literary criticism is very important it needs to be covered end to end it needs to be understood and if you can read original text nothing like that these are topics which you should strengthen your understanding on okay always keep that in mind and always try to strengthen your understanding okay now we come on to another question in dorothy wordsworth's journal it is mentioned that a highly famous poem by her brother william wordsworth was inspired from a walk the siblings took together around glencon glencon bay alswater in the lake district what is the name of the poem what is the name of the poem and there's special interest in the lives of women poets there is a special interest that you are able to see in the lives of your uh, you know your your uh, women poets women poets are given a lot of importance altogether you you are able to see that there is a lot of importance that is given to women poets women writers what is the right answer here everyone correct absolutely right absolutely right i wandered lonely as a cloud i wandered lonely as a cloud this is uh, the right answer so uh, dorothy wordsworth's journal it's mentioned that a highly famous poem by wordsworth was actually inspired by this alswater ride especially a lot of you who are preparing for pgt exams that's what i was telling yesterday also in the foundation batch class that if you're preparing for pgt exams romantic age has to be done in greater detail by the way right because you do get these kind of questions also that come in so on uh, 15th april 1802 wordsworth and dorothy they were taking this round in glencon bay in alswater when they came upon a long belt of daffodils and uh, you are able to see this is something that she captures also we saw a few daffodils close to the water side and the poem is neatly reflecting romanticism the core ideas the relationships that are there between man and woman that is something which is being described over there okay so please keep that in mind okay let's move on to the next one what singular poem by william wordsworth appears in two versions of his poetry collections collection songs of innocence and songs of experience with a distinct point of view each time with a distinct point of view each time with a distinct point of view each time so what singular poem by blake appears in two versions this is very simple yes puja avtara ayushi shikha everyone's answered it correctly the chimney sweeper the chimney sweeper is coming both in the songs of innocence and the songs of experience to complementary states of the human uh, existence altogether as you are able to see so chimney sweepers is the right answer and uh, here you are able to see that there is innocence which is being uh, reflected as innocence which is being spoken about that you are able to largely see okay so chimney sweepers it is what are the two settings in which coleridge the rhyme of the ancient mariner takes place what are the settings that you are able to see the settings there are two settings that you are you are largely able to see what are the two settings 
and anyone who's preparing for the next attempt make sure you're very comprehensive make sure you cover topics make sure you have proper uh, notes compiled for each unit that you're preparing uh, spend time in organizing your studies that will really help you overall in academic growth academic development you will be better placed and you know you'll have a better understanding altogether <coughs> i'm so sorry Yes, wedding party and ocean voyage, wedding party and ocean voyage. So rhyme of the ancient mariners telling you about retribution and retribution is something which is a very important theme, feeling guilt. Uh, Coleridge's writings, Conrad's writings are all about modern retribution, modern guilt that his uh, characters are undergoing. That is another major uh, concern that you're able to largely see. Which of the following statement is not true about biographical criticism? After some questions on romantic criticism, we are shifting gears altogether. Good evening, Mithun. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So which of the following statements is not true about biographical criticism? It is not true about biographical criticism. It is not something which is true about biographical criticism. What is the right answer here? Hi, Mithun. I'm doing good. Thanks so much, Pachi, for asking. I hope you're all set for your exam day after tomorrow. Good evening, Shalu. Ayushi Chatterjee, hi. Right, right. So uh, basically, when we are looking at biographical criticism, the question is not true. A reader can better appreciate a text by knowing a writer's struggles. That is true. Facts about an author's experience can help a reader decide how to interpret. That is true, right? That is also something which is absolutely true. Uh, a reader can understand a writer's preoccupation by studying the way they apply and modify their own life experiences in their works. But a reader's experience is superior? No, biographical criticism is not talking about a reader's experience. So again, reception theory, be clear with the funders, even though this is not a question on reception theory, this is a question that is largely coming and is telling you about the various types of criticism, mimetic criticism, biographical criticism that you're having. So criticism, there are also types that you're able to see, textual criticism and analysis. Good evening, Jagrati. So reader's experience is not superior. So reader's experience is not superior in biographical criticism. So Oscar Wilde, when you say that, you know, after he was imprisoned, Oscar Wilde did not write. When you say that after he was imprisoned, Oscar Wilde did not write. So that is an example of biographical criticism, right? That is an instance of biographical criticism altogether that you're able to see. Mimetic criticism first appeared in in the works, in the works of mimetic criticism, where is it appearing? Suti, be kind, be generous. Honestly, there will be all types of questions in your exams. There will be tough, moderate, easy questions. I'm sure if all of you have studied in a methodological manner, even if you spend an hour and a half every day besides your classes, you will definitely pull through. I'm 200% confident. Yes, absolutely right. Plato and Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle. So Plato and Aristotle, they are talking about mimetic criticism. Both Plato and Aristotle, they're the one who's talk, who are talking about mimesis. Mimesis is imitation. They're the ones who are talking about mimesis altogether, right? Please keep that in mind. Moving on to the next one, which of the following critic is known as an impressionistic critic? He's an impressionistic critic. Who's famously called as an impressionistic critic? Impressionistic critic, impressionism. What kind of impression are you forming? So where are we able to see? Hazlitt had also written on genius and common sense. On genius and common sense, Hazlitt has written this particular work. Yes, Walter Pater. Walter Pater. Walter Pater is a person. Walter Pater is a person who's associated with, uh, you know, he's an impressionistic critic. He's an impressionistic critic. Walter Pater, he's an impressionistic critic who, are, who you are having. And please remember this, that Hazlitt also in his, uh, in his work on genius and common sense said, you decide from feeling and not from reason. Right? So how you're feeling right now? Like a lot of you, you know, 
reason says you filled five copies right reason is saying like stuti is saying and you know uh, two or three of you at the beginning also said so what is reason saying reason is saying oh we all studied we've studied to the best of our ability we've completed the course but then feeling is like oh my god we are anxious so that is where you have to control your mind if you control your mind that's the biggest victory that you can have but if you are not able to control your mind then of course things will always be in problem right things will there'll always be a tussle altogether so controlling the mind is the most important thing controlling the mind is is the most critical thing okay moving on to the next question let's just move on to the next question who was who was the first scholar to use practical criticism also called applied criticism so who is using practical criticism which is also called applied criticism altogether what is the right answer Sorry, my mom called. Yeah, what is the right answer over here? Who's the first one to use practical criticism? So basically, remember Coleridge when in Biographia Literaria, he's telling you that ordinary language is different from literary language, right? When he talks about ordinary language being literary, uh, different from a literary language, that is when we are able to see that Coleridge is the one who is actually one of the first people to use about, to talk about practical criticism, first people to talk about practical criticism altogether, right? Please remember that practical criticism, also called applied criticism, it's trying to focus on text and trying to tell you that a textual language is different from textual language which is actually different from the ordinary language that you and I use altogether. Okay. Also remember, you have judicial criticism as you're able to see over here. What is, what is the importance of judicial criticism? Judicial criticism is important because it's trying to literally judge, evaluate a piece of writing, which mostly all critics, all critics are actually doing. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> The question is not about coining the term, right, uh, Ayushi, Vichy. The question is about who's the one who's properly utilizing the concept altogether. Okay. So please remember that. Which of the following is true of Aristotle's critical position? Which is true of Aristotle's critical position? Absolutely right. The best artistic text will be both complex and unified. Every part of the work will be essential to it and will be linked to every other part, right? So this is what you are able to see. Uh, remember, that is the reason why, why Francis Bacon is actually coming with Nuvum Organum. Right. Basically, what does he talks about? He talks about the unity of place, time and action. And he talks about, you know, one single method, uh, which is theoretically evaluating. Francis Bacon is coming with Nuvum Organum or the new method, which is challenging Aristotle's method. So that is challenging Aristotle's method altogether. OK, so here also you can keep that aspect in mind. The, the three unities, the, the text has to just display the unity of place, time and action. It has to be a unified whole altogether. It needs to be a unified whole altogether. That is what he primarily discusses. Of the five conditions of the sublime, according to Longinus, the most important condition is, what is the most important condition of the sublime that he talks about? What is the most important condition of the sublime that you're able to see? The most important condition of the sublime, according to Longinus. What is the most important condition? He, he talks about sublime. He's telling you about how there are, you know, you, you need to use noble expression, imaginative language, grand composition, lofty minds, strong. passion right absolutely right most important 
important is a lofty cast of right most important is a lofty cast of mind a lofty cast of mind is the most critical thing so when you compile you know when you when you start compiling your notes when you start putting your notes together automatically you see that there will be more awareness of such kind of questions you'll be able to collate it properly long analysis on the sublime is as it is like a very simple topic per se to understand it's not that that complicated it's not that difficult at all uh, so again if you if you have proper understanding you'll be able to understand it okay so imaginative language noble expression grand composition lofty mind strong passions all of these are very important all of these are extremely important so the five conditions he is talking about the lofty cast of mind the lofty cast of mind why are goals higher than what we can achieve because goals are stretch goals goals are stretch goals that we are able to look at right the goals are the stretch goals can you all hear me okay i think it's it's maybe there there would have been a glitch uh, but now it must be audible Okay, now it must be audible. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Who among the following believe that rhyme is not an integral part of poetry? Rhyme is not an integral part of poetry. Who believed? We've actually looked at, we've actually looked at this question. Rhyme is not an integral part of poetry. Thanks, Nidhi, for confirming, Bache. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. Absolutely right. So Horace and Sir Philip Sidney both believed that rhyme is not essential. Rhyme is not something which is essential. Both Horace as well as Sir Philip Sidney believed in that. Right. So Horace in Ars Poetica and Sydney in Apology for Poesy, both of them are trying to tell you that rhyme is not the most important part. Rhyme is not the most important part. Which of the following statements is true about Aristotle's poetics? It's true about Aristotle's poetics. Which of them is actually true about Aristotle's poetics? Which one do you think is actually true when we are looking at Aristotle's poetics? Yes, Rupesh. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. We did that question yesterday. Which is true, which is true uh, when we are looking at Aristotle's poetics, right? He is trying to tell you that the true value of poetry is on imitation rather than rhetoric. Imitation, the more lifelike it is going to be, that will be important. That is the reason Shakespeare is a great bard because he is very, very realistic, right? He is very, very realistic altogether. And those are the features that we are able to see right those are the features that we are largely able to see so aristotle defines tragedy and comedy in terms of mimesis in his poetry and while uh, you know plato dismissed art as far removed from reality uh, we are able to see that that you know uh, both of them both of them so here we we need to understand that how uh, you know <coughs> imitation sorry imitation was more important than rhetoric and that is the reason even Horace, right? That is the reason even Horace and Sydney are saying rhyme is not important for poetry. Rhyme is not important for poetry. The essence lies elsewhere. The essence that you're able to see lies elsewhere. The essence is elsewhere altogether. Who among the following ancients prescribed that poetry should both instruct and delight? This should be immediately answered. Poetry should instruct and delight. Who's the one who's actually prescribing that poetry should both instruct and delight? Who's the one who's talking about poetry instructing and delighting? Both. What is the correct answer here, everyone? Right, Horace is the right answer. Horace was the one who, who has actually talked about in Ars Poetica that poetry should have both a didactic as well as it should instruct people altogether. To whom, to whom did Sidney compare his knowledge of poetry in an apology of poesy, in an apology for poesy? So... He actually starts, remember, he starts the apology for poesy with this particular person being mentioned. He's starting apology for poesy with this particular person which he's mentioned. What is this? Uh, what is the right answer here? Right, Puglanio is the right answer. Shantani, Kaberi, Somya, and uh, everyone's answered it correctly. Poglanio is the right answer. So Poglanio is, of course, talking about horsemanship. He's talking about horsemanship. And he says when he can justify horses, I can definitely, I can definitely justify 
Uh, Manjuri, all of the writers are coming from the syllabus only. Nothing is coming outside the syllabus. Don't worry. It's just that some syllabus, some writers you're covering. And today, right now, we are focusing on literary criticism, fiction. A lot of these questions that you will come across is just that whether you you've taken the correct approach or not. Who among the following antique poet is remembered in Sydney's apology for poesy? Who is remembered? Who is uh, who is remembered? Who is remembered? Sydney is telling you about three major Greek poets, three major Greek poets and writers. Who are these three major Greek poets and writers? Who are these three major Greek poets and writers? Fan Lipping has got the right answer. Fan Lipping, I don't know if this was for the previous question, but this is the right answer. Homer, Hesiod, Mosius. Homer, Hesiod, Mosius. These were the three major, these were the three major people that we were able to see, right? So Homer, Hesiod and Mosius, all of them are the right answer over here, okay? So the antique poet who's remembered in uh, Sir Philip Sidney's Apology for Poesy, that is what you're able to see. So Sydney is calling upon Mosius, Homer and Hesiod. Mosius, Homer and Hesiod. <coughs> Sorry, Philip Sidney is actually referring to them. Philip Sidney is actually referring to them. Philip Sidney is the one who is actually referring to them. Please keep that in mind. Which of the following is not a distinctive feature of poetry? It is not a distinctive feature of poetry. Which is not a distinguishing feature of poetry? Which is not a distinguishing feature of poetry? Which is not? It's written in verse. This is not. It uses language. It uses rhythm most of the times. It uses harmony. But it will not use verse. It will not use verse. That's not necessary. Right? It will not use verse altogether. That is not necessary. So even, even when we are looking at the ancient classical texts, they're also trying to tell you about the same. Right? They're also trying to tell you about the same. Which of the following contains a mix of direct and indirect narrative? Direct and indirect narrative. Which is using direct and indirect narrative together? Direct and indirect narrative together. Which one is using direct and indirect narrative together? Direct and indirect narrative. What is using direct and indirect narrative? Homeric epic, okay? So the Homeric epic, the Homeric epic is actually using the direct and indirect method together, the direct and indirect method together. So extended metaphors as we are able to see, right? Uh, extended metaphors as we are able to see, <coughs> very good, very good FS. All the people who are clearing the West Bengal set exam, excellent. So that's what, just be very consistent. It's all your own hard work only. How organized are you? <laughs> How well are you critically looking at everything? How well are you curious about knowledge? That really creates a lot of impact, right? That really creates a lot of impact. So here, your Homeric epics that you're able to see are largely associated with using both direct and indirect, using both direct and indirect, which of the following is not an art in the Greek sense of the word, is not an art in the Greek sense of the word. It's not an art in the Greek sense of the word. Is not an art in the Greek sense of the word. Right. A peacock's feather. Uh, a peacock's feather is absolutely the right answer because we are able to see that all the other things are actually uh, mentioned, but peacock's feather isn't, right? Peacock's feather isn't. Okay. Moving on over here, let's just see which of the following is not a reason why we like imitations is not a reason is not a reason which is not a reason which is not a reason which of the following is not a reason is not a reason primarily right is not a reason yes there's a sense of safety in not having to deal with reality right so so that is not there that is not there we we really want to know reality we really want to know reality altogether so that is again 
uh, extremely important. Okay, that is also something which we really need to be mindful of. <coughs> okay, please, please keep that in mind. Okay, which of the following was the last to evolve? Which of the following was the last to evolve? Which of the following was the last to evolve? The last to evolve? Which of the following was actually the last to evolve? The last to evolve. Right? It was actually the last to evolve. And it's very surprising because the most important one was actually the last to evolve. Right? It was actually the last to evolve. It's tragedy, right? It's tragedy. So tragedy was one of the last two evolves. Tragedy was actually one of the last two evolves, by the way. It was the last to evolve. So like I said, if you classify, you know, if you keep your uh, study segmented classical criticism, then you complete classical criticism and classical literature. Then you move on to looking at classical myths also. Then you move on to Renaissance. If you follow open order studies they are the most easiest and most scoring units right they're the most easiest and most scoring units that you'll be able to see all together please remember that which of the following is not one of the three unities it is not one of the three unities <coughs> sorry Okay, we haven't got which the following is not one of the three unities. This was really simple. So unity of place, time and action is there. Unity of character is not there, right? Unity of character is not there. Please remember that unity of character is not something which you are able to see is coming in. Right? The unity of character that you are able to look at, that is something which you have to be mindful of that is not there. I hope it is clear to everybody about it. Let's practice five more questions on criticism. Then I'll move on to fiction. And uh, tomorrow, <coughs> tomorrow if we meet, um, anyway, I'll, I'll discuss that. I'll discuss that. Let's, let's very quickly, let's very, very quickly, swiftly move uh, at looking at some more questions. All of these are also important. Mythos or plot, character, thought, melody, spectacle. Please remember that. Okay. Okay. Which of the following is the most important? Uh, which of the following is most important? So again, what is most important? This is also very simple. Which of the following is the most important? What is most important? Plot is the most important, right? Plot is the most important. Plot is something which is very, very critical altogether. And which of the following is least important? Which of the following is least important? Most important is plot. Which is least important? Which is least important? Which is least important? Spectacle is least important. Okay, spectacle is least important. Manjuri, completely up to you. You can take your time and figure out whether you want to do it at the beginning or at the end. Completely up to you. Right. <coughs> so, spectacle is least important. Okay, spectacle is least important. Spectacle is something which is least important, by the way. Which of the following is not a part of Aristotle's definition of tragedy? It is not a part of Aristotle's definition of tragedy which is not a part of Aristotle's definition of tragedy. <clears throat> not a part of Aristotle's definition of tragedy. So it's very ironical that tragedy we consider to be associated with unhappy endings, but that is not even part. That is not even a part of Aristotle's definition. He's not telling you it has an unhappy ending. That is not even a part. That is not even a part, by the way. Right. So while he talks about mythos or the plot, he's trying to talk about this, you know, the, the fact that um, unhappy endings, that is not even a part. That is not even a part altogether. Which of the following genres has the same plot structure as tragedy? It has the same plot structure as tragedy. 
which of the following has the same plot structure as tragedy? It has the same plot structure as tragedy. What is the right answer? What is the right answer? So epic poetry, epic poetry, right, has the same plot structure as the tragedy. It has the same plot structure as the tragedy that you're able to see. So when we're looking at epic poetry, it has the largely the same uh, plot structure altogether. Which of the following has an episodic structure? It is having an episodic structure. Which will have an episodic structure? <clears throat> so both biography as well as poetry, both biography as well as, sorry, both biography as well as history, they are having an episodic structure, right? Both of them are actually having an episodic structure altogether, right? Uh, also, uh, similarly, these kind of questions, complex plot, a complex plot has to have both peripetia, anagnosis, anagnosis is recognition, peripetia is the reversal of fortune, right? That is what you're able to see and one should have both, right? One should have actually both, both both these elements have to be there. Both these elements have to be there. One more question uh, on uh, criticism. Which of the following is not necessary to all tragedies? Which is not necessary to all tragedies? Which is not necessary to all tragedies altogether? Which is not necessary to all tragedies? Right, commos, commos is not actually, commos is something which is not there. Okay, what, what I, I basically uh, do is I would also like to uh, share some questions related to fiction. All right. Uh, I would also like to quickly discuss a few questions related to fiction as well. Uh, I hope you're all getting the idea. The idea is that you cover a, a topic comprehensively, you understand a topic properly, and then after that, you actually try to compile all your notes together. Okay. We will cover a few questions on fiction. And what I'm planning to do is you can let me know if I take a marathon class, uh, we'll of course continue for another half an hour or 40 minutes more. And we'll cover a few more questions on fiction which are important uh, but are all of you available are all of you available for a quick class tomorrow at six o'clock uh, or uh, you know will you be traveling what do you think uh, just just give it a thought and in the meantime I'm just pulling out some more questions that we have prepared for all of you on fiction so that we can also cover uh, fiction in one go for all of you but in the meantime uh, just just let us know uh, your views and thoughts in case like you know if, if we take a marathon from say 6 to 9 or 6 to 8 30 tomorrow 6 p.m to 8 30 p.m tomorrow will it be convenient for all of you to participate and because you know last minute uh it's always a good idea to just cover um the bare minimum things right and and one good way is just to watch uh the 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 classes that we're probably conducting so that that just eases out most of your pressure also right <coughs> so Okay, so six to eight, do you think it'll work? Abhi, I'm not leaving you. I'm, I'm, I'm just pulling out the fiction slide also. 
so don't don't think that you are you are actually done uh, rather for fiction had collated about like 200 pointers but 120 in one part but if not all 120 right now we will of course uh, cover a couple of those concepts and tomorrow maybe like most of you are also saying i think uh, one or two of you at the beginning said cultural studies so maybe i can review all the units tomorrow in one go uh, we can cover 10 to 15 10 to 15 major key concepts in each unit so that you know you can just refresh your memory also uh, okay, perfect, perfect. Thanks so much. This is very, very helpful. This is very, very helpful. So I'm, I'm pulling out. Abhi, there is no need for you to go because uh, we, we are not done yet with the class. I'm just pulling out my sheet. I'm just pulling out my sheet for, uh, for everybody's reference, and we'll be practicing a few questions related to. <coughs> Sorry. Uh... <laughs> Simran's like class marathon you took. I'm, I'm glad, Simran, that you remember, Bache. That's very nice uh, to, to know that, that, you, that you still remember that. I'm just pulling out my sheet uh, altogether for your fiction questions so that all of us can look uh, back at these questions. And uh, maybe what we can do is I can, I can collate all the questions. Uh, nice, Nithi. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, that's interesting. Amrita, I'd actually need some time to collate also uh, the material because I don't want to like, you know, just, just come. Um... Oh, God. I think I lost. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm just pulling out that sheet. Okay, uh, I'm just pulling out my sheet on fiction. Let's let's quickly review those questions on fiction as well, so that you get better clarity. So these are a few questions that we had for fiction also. I will just do a slideshow so that all of you can actually see that. Okay. Uh, so let's let's quickly cover a few questions. So fiction is also going to be, fiction is also going to be an important question topic agenda. Literary criticism, like I said, is very interesting and it's a base foundation for your uh, for covering uh, your, uh, you know, your other questions that are going to be coming. Okay. So please remember that. Yes, yes, of course. Positivity will be on... Uh, you know, the next level, we will definitely be focusing on that. That is, of course, the priority. Okay, uh, so so let's let's very, very quickly get started. Let's very, very quickly get started and cover uh, maximum gr ground. Who has written the short story Voter? The Voter is written by. The Voter is written by. Who's the writer who's written The Voter? The Voter is a work written by. Okay, I got shit scared. My pin came down. I was like, okay, what is it? And I didn't want it to shout. <clears throat> I'm so glad, Samya. That's so sweet of you, Bache. That's so sweet of you. Who's written the voter? In the Achebe, right? Achebe is the writer. Achebe Chinwa Achebe is the person who's written the short story called Voter. So, short story, uh, Voter is coming from the pen of Chinua Achebe. Chinua Achebe is the one who has written the voter. Okay. Chinua Achebe is the writer. Why is the answer not coming? Anyway, Achebe is a writer who's written and tradition versus modernity is a theme that is coming in the voter. The Adventures of Caleb Williams is a novel written by who's a writer writing The Adventures of Caleb Williams. The Adventures of Caleb Williams. This is a work written by who's a writer who's writing this particular work. The Adventures of Caleb Williams. The Adventures of Caleb Williams is a work written by. <coughs> William Godwin is the right answer. Absolutely right. William Godwin is the right answer over here. William Godwin writes Adventures of Caleb Williams, right? Godwin is the person who's writing the Adventures of Caleb Williams. So one second, I think uh, all the questions. 
since I've just gone a little faster. This is, I'm, I'm just going walking you through then because I think most of you have seen the answers over here. This is an important piece of enlightenment. So when we are looking at Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther or when we are looking at The Adventures of Caleb Williams, these are all important works that you'll have to keep in mind. Okay, uh, Gunter Grass's Tindrum, we are able to see how I, I just, I think accidentally we, we saw the answer. So I'm quickly telling you. So when we are looking at Gunter Grass's Tindrum, Gunter Grass is an important German writer, we are able to see that this Tindram opens uh, when Oscar Mazaritz, it's, it's, he is in a mental hospital, he's writing his own story, he's trying to show, share his own story. This work is a part of the Dancing Trilogy. <coughs> Sorry, I'm glad Manjri, that's so sweet of you, Bache. So this is a part. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> This is a part of the Dancing Trilogy, right? This is actually a part of the Dancing Trilogy. So, Gruntergrass's novel, Tindrum, we are able to see. Also, one more thing before I forget, um, I want all of you to just, uh, you know, uh, just me message me your number. Email me your number on nirja.raheja. Let me, let me just, uh, let me just make this announcement. Otherwise, I'll forget it only. Okay, uh, and it'll be very, very helpful for all of us to, you know, uh, uh, work out a good analysis altogether. Wait, let me just, uh, <clears throat> let me just share my mail ID. So uh, this is my mail ID. All of you can actually just uh, make a note of this. Okay, uh, it's nirja.raheja at the rate grada at the rate grada. Dot co. I will personally call all of you. Uh, please let me know uh, your number. So when you, you are typing the subject, okay, if you want to help your friends, because remember, you were also in this particular position when you were preparing for the exam last year. And a lot of students at that time helped us with the analysis. And that really bring, brought a lot of uh, understanding, uh, or, you know, of the paper. So I highly urge all of you to please make sure that, you know, you mail uh, as a subject, you can, you can type your name, you can type Type your number okay your contact details right so just mention your contact details your contact details and also please mention whether it is a morning shift that you have got along with your timings or the evening shift that you have got okay so it'll be great if all of you can volunteer and help us this will really help us with the analysis we'll also be coming up with like i told you we are coming up with a couple of uh, other important things uh, so that, you know, the YouTube classes are not interrupted at all. So this will really help us with the analysis bit. Okay. Uh, you have to write down your contact number. So please mail me, please mail me your contact number. Rupesh is asking contact number. You have to do that. Okay. Uh, so please, please let us know like your name, for instance, my name is okay. I, I, I think Rupesh is very proactive mostly. So for instance, if my name is Rupesh and my number is whatever, you know, whatever, uh, whatever. Okay. And then uh, say evening shift. Okay. Evening shift. So just, just mention this. I'll personally contact all of you, uh, whoever mails me and uh, I will personally uh, tap like, you know, uh, your analysis of the paper. Okay. So please keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So sweet. So sweet. Aziz is like, don't need to urge. We'll send it across. That's very, very sweet. Okay. So please make a note of this. I'll, I'll let this be, I'll let this be. Uh, over here but please remember it'll be great if all of you can volunteer it'll be generally very very helpful for your peers because remember they were in the uh, in your shoes last year so all these things will really help us so yes uh, Oscar Mazzarith like I was saying Oscar Mazzarith was a person okay I think it just goes like <clears throat> thank you Nidhi that's so sweet of you that's so sweet of you Nithi has already sent it. God bless you. So I'll I'll touch base. I'll connect with all of you in the morning. Though I'll not call you right now, like uh, like a fool. I'll connect with all of you in the morning, or I'll I'll WhatsApp uh, you. Okay, I'll or I'll WhatsApp you. So okay, perfect. So uh, here this was another question. By the way, this was another question that has come. I think uh, there's some amount of lag in the internet. Maybe that is the reason this is not coming in. Okay, I think there is a little bit of a lag. 
Okay, now it's fine. So this question is clear. Tindrum opens in the mental hospital when Oscar is trying to tell us his story. Tindrum is a part of the dancing trilogy. And this is by a German writer. What are the other parts of the dancing trilogy? Cat and mouse and dog ears. Cat and mouse and dog ears are the other parts of the dancing trilogy. Okay, so please keep that in mind. And then this was a question. D.H. Lawrence's The Plumed Serpent 1926 is set in which country? So this particular, thank you, Alka. God bless you all of you who are sending thank you so much really means a lot we will con connect with all of you and i will personally also try to reach out to all of you please help us uh and, and like i said you know your peers were there okay so uh please make sure so dh lawrence says the plumed serpent is set in which country plumed serpent is in which country i i just like you know this this came in it's in mexico plumed serpent is set in mexico plumed serpent is set in mexico so plumed ser serpent is coming in mexico it's political fiction it is telling you about the aftermath of the mexican revolution that had taken place aftermath of Re mexican revolution we have done questions on women in love we've done questions on rainbow uh one or two questions previously we had done it on lady chatterley's lover but this time of course we've not what does mortardy arthur mean what do we mean by mortardy arthur what do we thank you anubha thank you these are all the emails that i'm receiving right now that i'm acknowledging what does mota d arthur mean what does mota d arthur mean mota d arthur means what <clears throat> yes uh i i can i can we we can figure out that also yes mota d arthur means what mota d arthur means what Mortar the Arthur is death of Arthur. Mortar the Arthur is death of Arthur. Okay. Mortar the Arthur is death of Arthur. So, Sir Mallory is the one, the baronet writer who's writing, and Mortar the Arthur is the death of the author that we are able to see. <coughs> okay. That is what is Mortar the Arthur. It is death of King Arthur. It is death of King Arthur. Uh, that is what we are able to see. Joseph Conrad's Nostromo. Joseph Conrad's Nostromo is set. Uh, a tale of the seaboard is set in fictitious country of. Fictitious country of. Which fictitious country are we able to see? That Nostromo is set in. That Nostromo is set in. <clears throat> Nostromo is set in which, which country? It's set in Costa Guana. Where is it set in? It's set in Costa Guana. So Nostromo, Tale of the Seaboat, where is it set in? It's set in Costa Guana. Nostromo is set in the South American country of, Nos uh, of Costa Guana. Okay. Where is it set? It's Costa Guana. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Santosh. I've received your email as well. Thank you. Really so sweet and very kind of all of you. Okay, so Nostromo, Tale of the Seaboat, that is what you're able to see. It's set in Costa Guana. Simran, thank you. Okay. I think I'll get to know a lot of you personally also. Right. So Nostromo is set in the South American country of Costa Guana. Right. And again, like we were talking about, retribution becomes a very important theme in most of guilt is something which is being spoken about by Conrad. Okay. Guilt is something that Conrad talks about in greater detail. Okay, moving on to the next question. In George Eliot's novel, Silas Mariner, the eponymous character is falsely accused of. Thank you, Sushmita. <clears throat> so what is what is in George Eliot's novel, Silas Mariner, the eponymous character is falsely accused of what? The eponymous character is falsely accused of what? <clears throat> Thanks, Nidhi. I, I would have definitely received it, but if you've sent it. Right. Absolutely right. Stealing the congregation's funds. That is what you're able to see. The Weaver of Rav Ravalo. The Weaver of Ravalo. That is the uh, subtitle of Silas Mariner. And stealing the congregation's funds is the is the accuse uh, the acquisition that you're able to see. So the novel is set in the 19th century. He's a weaver. He's a member of a small Calvinistic congregation. And you are able to see that he's falsely accused that he's taken congregation's funds, right? Uh, he's taken congregation's funds altogether. Okay. Uh, no worries at all. That's perfectly all right. <coughs> Classroom students, I hope you're able to recollect Victorian age is something that we'll be looking at tomorrow at 9 p.m. So please read Victorian age, okay? Victorian age is something that we'll be covering tomorrow. So please read uh, on Victorian age and come. <clears throat> In Charles Dickens' Little Dorriot, which of the following British prisons? 
is featured which of the following british prisons is featured so which of the following british prisons is being featured over here <clears throat> which of the following british prisons is featured absolutely right absolutely right marshall c i think i saw one of you no none of you Marshall C, Marshall C, Marshall C, right? Marshall C prison was the prison for debtors. Marshall C prison was the prison for debtors, right? So we are able to see that this is there. Thank you, Anuba. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. No, Anuba's. Okay, Anuba's like, can you please share the PDF? Okay, all right. Uh, all right, yes. So Marshall C, Marshall C prison house is the one, right? Marshall C prison house is the one. Don't worry, we're coming up with a lot of modules and booklets. So you'll, you'll have a lot of PDFs, Anuba, that you'll be like, okay, oh God, there have been so many PDFs now. What to do? Okay, so Marshall C prison house is there. Kamala Markhandia's Nectar in a Sieve derives its title from a poem by... Kamala Markhandia's Nectar in a Sieve derives its title from a poem by. <clears throat> Thank you, Dominator Rajneesh. So Kamala Markhandia's Nectar in a Sieve derives its title from a poem by. It's deriving its, its title from a poem by. What, what is it deriving its, its title from? It's de deriving its title from a poem by. By Coleridge. Very good. Very good. Stuti Aziz. Everyone's absolutely right. You are able to see Markhandia's work. This is coming from, from Coleridge's writing. S.T. Coleridge's writing. So Markhandia's work. So Nectar in a Sieve. The book is set in India. And you're able to see that, you know, the title is coming from Coleridge's writing. The title is coming from Coleridge's writing. Work without hope. Work without hope. Right? Work without hope draws a nectar in a sieve. And hope without an object cannot live. Hope without an object cannot live. Okay, moving on to the next question that you are having. Let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer for this particular question. Del Jordan appears in which of the following Alice, uh, Alice Morrow's works? Alice Monroe's works. In which of the following Alice Monroe's works are you able to see? Alice Monroe's works are you able to see? This is Alice Munro. Okay, this is Alice Munro. Yes, work without hope. Right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Li lives of girls and women. Lives of girls and women. I think I saw one or two D also. So lives of girls and women is the right answer. Lives of girls and women is the right answer. Right. So that is the correct answer. Lives of girls and women. This is a short story cycle by Alice Munro. And it is telling you about Del Jordan. Del Jordan. Right. Del Jordan. Coming of age of Del Jordan altogether. That is what you're able to see. Del Jordan. R.K. Narayan's writings, this is the next question that you're able to see, right? Uh, this is the next question. In R.K. Narayan's The Bachelor of Arts, why was Chandran rejected by uh, Malathi's parents, by Mal Malthi's parents, by Malthi's parents? <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Dominator Rajneesh, I've got it, Bachri, I've got it. Thank you so much. I've got your message. Be prepared for getting like calls from me tomorrow, okay? <clears throat> What is the right answer in Arkin Orion's The Bachelor of Arts? Why was Chandran rejected by Malti's parents? Because he has, he was Manglik, right? He was Manglik. He was Manglik. Again, in these kind of questions, you can actually use your mind. And then most commonly, those are the issues. So he was Manglik altogether, right? So that was the major reason. That was the major reason that you were able to see was rejected, was rejected altogether. Mulkraj Anand's Untouchable is set in which of the following Indian towns? Amulkraj Anand's Untouchables is set in which of the following Indian towns? It is set in which of the following Indian towns? <clears throat> Untouchables, where is it set? Where are you able to see? I think I lost it.
Okay, what is the right answer? Yes, it's the cantonment town of Bulasha. Bulasha, right? A is absolutely the right answer. So it is set in the North Indian cantonment town of Bulasha. One day life in the uh, in the history of Bakha, right? Bakha's life story is something which is being represented over here. So Bulasha is absolutely the right answer over here. So Untouchables is set in Bulasha. Right. Again, when you're compiling your notes on Indian writings, you can actually cover it up. You can actually make sure that, you know, you make your notes in, in a more comprehens uh, comprehensive way altogether. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Let's just quickly move on to the next question. <clears throat> Arundhati Roy is the God of Small Things series. It's title, uh, title from which of the following writers? From which of the following writers is it taking? Nice, nice, Ravi. That's true. Right, 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 right. John Berger, John Berger, right? John Berger, John Berger, that is what you're able to see. So there is a the different type of storytelling pattern. It's non-linear. John Berger is the right answer over here. And this debut novel by Arundhati Roy, it's set in Iron Man. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you can cover uh, God of Small Things in greater detail. Fraternal twins Rachel and Estrepin are there. And these two twins are reunited. How they're incapable of loving anybody but themselves because of the childhood mishap that they had experienced altogether. Never again will a single story be told as though it's only one. Uh, as, as though it's only one. So, you know, you are able to see that that is something which is being spoken about. But otherwise also cover God of Small Things. You can actually look at God of Small Things in greater detail. Kiran these sites, the inheritance of loss uses historical backdrop of. What is uh, it using? What is it using? What Which historical background is it using? It's using the historical background of. It's using the historical background of the. Gorkhaland movement. The Gorkhaland movement is something which is being used about over here, right? The Gorkhaland movement, Kiran Desai's inheritance of loss. This is using the Gorkhaland movement as the backdrop altogether. Gorkhaland movement is being used. It won a couple of awards and the story is telling about Biju, Sai. Biju is an Indian living in the United States, right? And uh, he's a son of a cook who works for Sai's grandfather. Sai is, of course, uh, orphan living in, in Kalampong, right? But Gorkhaland movement is something which is being spoken about over here okay please uh, remember that moving on to the next question let's see how many of you get the right answer over here the character of hukam chand appears in which of the following indian novels the character of hukam chand hukam chand appears in which of the following indian novels Right. Kushwan Singh's The Train to Pakistan is absolutely the right answer. That is where the character of Hukam, uh, Hukam Chand is actually coming. It is trying to tell you, uh, it is trying to tell you about the story of um, you know, about partition of India altogether. And 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 what are you able to see? You're able to see that, you know, it's trying to focus on a microcosmic brutality, which is symbolic of the larger issue of partition, partition writings, partition novels. This is also another important topic, by the way, that you should ideally cover. Okay, this is this is again very interesting a question that comes in and this is easier a question also. So the 2008 Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni's The Palace of Illusions is a retelling of Mahabharata by which of the following female characters? It's a retelling of the Mahabharata by which of the following uh, female characters? By which of the following female characters? Are you able to see this is coming? <clears throat> Uh, who who is it that we are able to see? So it is basically Panchali, right? This is basically Panchali who is coming in, right? Panchali, Panchali is is the like you know the wife of the uh, the the so called uh, you know the the Pandavas who were there, right? Draupadi, so to say, right? Panchali, Draupadi, Panchali, Draupadi, 
So again, classical writings, in classical Indian literature, Palace of Illusions, Indian aesthetics is something that you will have to cover. So a couple of interesting topics that we'll be covering, uh, you know, trying to provide a basic funda altogether of them as well. So Palace of Illusions, this is, of course, coming. It's narrated by Panchali, who's the wife of the legendary Pandavas. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Here we go on to the next question. <coughs> Sorry. Which of the following Nigerian novels revolves around a spirit child who can move back and forth between the human and spirit worlds? What is the right answer here? Who can move back and forth? Okay, one second. I'll just after this question put my charger also, otherwise, I'll just lose battery. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Absolutely right. Ben Okri's The Famished Road is the right answer. Ben Okri's Famished Road is absolutely the right answer. You will have to do the Booker Award winning writers as well, right? So when you're looking at Booker Award winning writers, when you're looking at your partition writings, when you're covering Indian aesthetics, all of these are major topics, right? All of these are major topics. And we started by looking at Fat Studies, which was another, uh, you know, interesting work that you were able to largely see. So always try and make sure that you have proper understanding of all these new emerging topics topics because you know they will be asked in your exams overall azaro who's coming in all right let's move on to the next question that is coming your way this is the next question that you have one second i'm just putting my my laptop on charge Sorry. All right. So who kills the religious frantic violent patriarch of the Pachiki family in Adichie's Purple Hibiscus? The wife Beatrice is doing that, right? The wife Beatrice is doing that. The wife Beatrice is actually doing that. So what are we able to see? Purple Hibiscus, this is written by Adichie. Purple Hibiscus is set in the post-colonial Nigeria. And what are we able to see? The that Kambili. Thank you, Prashant. That's so sweet of you. Thank you so much. Uh, that Kambili... Uh, is actually the one, uh, you know, you, you're finally able to see how the wife Beatrice is actually killing. So again, these all writings, South African writings, African literature, they're also becoming important from your examination perspective. So cover them end to end, look at Okay. 
Okay, I think uh, I I lost network there. Which of the following characters? Which of the following characters is assassinated by the regime in Chinuachbe's Antils of Savannah? Antils of Savannah. Antils of Savannah. So it's Ikim. It's Ikim, right? Antils of Savannah. You are able to see that how it is taking place in Kangan, and here overall we are able to see that Ikim, right? So Ikim is actually assassinated. There is this this assassination that is taking place. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next question very very quickly. Moving on to the next question that we have for all of you very very quickly. Which of the following is not a theme in Gugiva Thiongo's novels, Petals of Blood? Which of the following is not a theme in Gugiva Thiongo's Petals of Blood? Petals of Blood is not, is not a theme. <clears throat> it's about Mao Mao and how the characters are dealing with Mao Mao, how they retreat all together. That is what you're able to see. So finally, what is it that we're able to look at? Finally, what is it that we're able to look at? Yes, yes, yes. By and large, you're right. So uh, so subjection of Kenyan women is not a part of it. Subjection of Kenyan women is not something uh, that is being discussed over here. That is not a priority at all. Rest, everything else is being discussed, right? Rest, everything else is being discussed. It's telling you about Munira, Abdullah, Vanja, Karega, four people. And Mao Mao really is the commonality between the lives of all four people. How they want to escape the city life and they go on to El Morg. And, uh, you know, how they are dealing with the repercussions of the Mau Mau rev revolution, that is also something that we're able to largely see. Let's move on to the next question that we are having. Let's just uh, move on to the next question and see how many of you are able to get the right answer over here. Let's see how many of you get it right. In which of the following, in which of the following Nadine Godemer's novels, a liberal white South African family has to flee to the native village on uh, on the, their black servant, on their black servant. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> July's people is absolutely the right answer. July's people is absolutely the right answer. Nice, Tuti. I'm really glad. I'm really glad to hear that. So, uh, Godemer's novels, a liberal white South African family has to flee. And uh, this is July's people that we are able to look at, right? This is July's people that you're able to see. So, July's people is by Nadine Godemer. It is uh, a work where, you know, apartheid has ended through the civil war uh, altogether. And it was banned, by the way. So, one of the most banned writers is also Godemer. Even though Godemer has received the Nobel Prize. But you're able to see that she's also one of the most banned writers that you're able to see. Okay, so please keep that also in mind and perspective. Okay, in uh, J.M. Kozi's novel, Waiting for the Barbarians, what does the magistrate's recurring dream infer? What does the magistrate's recurring dream infer? What does the magistrate's recurring dream? What does uh, the magistrate's recurring dream infer? J.M. Kozi's novel, Waiting for the Barbarians, what does the magistrate's recurring dream infer? The magistrate's recurring dream, what does it infer? Waiting for the barbarians. Menika is right, absolutely right. The relationship between civilized humanities and monstrousness. Monstrousness, that is something which is being spoken about over here. So waiting for barbarians, again, important by Kodsi. Kodsi, the recipient of the Booker Prize twice, also the recipient of the Nobel Prize that you're able to see. <laughs> Anybody who's not studied what you all can actually do is you can prepare your notes now more comprehensively make sure that you know you cover every aspect so you know you should be prepared if not for this attempt you should be prepared for the next attempt so cover comprehensively try to see where the lack is try to see where the lacuna is and then accordingly act right and then accordingly act that is also something that you'll have to keep in mind by uh, by default and and you know you will have to understand it who is the protagonist of uh, Faswane Mappi's Welcome to Our Hillbro? So who is Faswane Mappi's Welcome to Our Hillbro? Who's the protagonist? Welcome to Our Hillbro. Welcome to Our Hillbro. Welcome to Our Hillbro. Who's the one who's actually uh, associated? So, so when we are looking at 
Pafani, Mefis, uh, welcome to our hill, bro. Welcome to our hill, bro. Right, Sushmita has got it right. Sushmita has got it right. Rafenste is absolutely the right answer over here. Right, that is uh, the true answer. Welcome to our Hillbro. Welcome to our Hillbro is written by Mapai and it's dealing with xenophobia, AIDS. Uh, and, and you know, when it was coming in, you are able to see Rafense, that's the main character, Rafense Moro, uh, undergoing a lot of problems in the Johannesburg society. He's a professor, he's in love with a woman called Loretto. And what are you able to see? You're able to see that, you know, Loretto and his best friend, they are making love. He commits suicide by jumping off the the building altogether. So welcome to our hill bro by my papi, right? It's telling you about Refenstein. So even if you have not covered South African literature, and if you plan to do that, at least these writers you should definitely cover. Okay, these writers you should definitely cover. In uh, Armahas, the beautiful ones are not yet born, which the following Ghanaian president's regime has been referred to, which the following Ghanaian... Uh, <clears throat> What is the right answer over here? Some of you are cartoons in classic pieces, I tell you. Anyway, what is the right answer? Our Mahas, the beautiful ones are not yet born, which the following Ghanaian president's regime has been referred to. Yes, 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 yes. Very good, very good. Ayushi Chatterjee has got the right answer. Kurmaha's regime is absolutely, uh, Wami Kurmaha's regime has been referred to. The beautiful ones are not yet born. This is by Armaha, right? This was a debut work by Armaha. This was a debut writing that Armaha had actually come up with. And it was published in 1968. Uh, this was coming by Hoganton Mifflin. Uh, this was published by Hoganton Mifflin. So again, these all works, at least in African writings, you should be able to cover. Okay, moving on to the next question. The preface to Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man has been taken from. Where is it, the preface being taken from? Where is the preface being taken from? Right, right. It's it's taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis, right? Ovid's Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is transformation. Metamorphosis is basically talking about transformation. Let's cover uh, 30 questions at least. So then it'll be like, you know, 30 to 35 questions there and 30 questions more over here. And tomorrow, then if all of you are comfortable, let's just have a quick marathon at six o'clock and cover most important pointers. And then by 9, 9.30, all of you can sleep uh, for the next day. And uh, whoever has mailed me, uh, I will uh, be touching base with all of you and whoever is interested to share the analysis please make sure that your name your contact details morning or evening shift if you want to volunteer for the analysis please do let us know about it okay <coughs> Okay, uh, this is the next question that has come right in front of you. Let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer over here. Which of the following characters, which of the following characters are Clarissa's lovers in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway? They are Clarissa's lovers. Okay, Aziz. Right, so which of the following characters are Clarissa's lovers in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway? which are the lovers. So Peter Walsh and Sally Seaton. Peter Walsh and Sally Seaton, they are the lovers. Peter Walsh and Sally Seaton. Peter Walsh and Sally, Sally Seaton, they are the lovers of Mrs. Dalloway. These are the lovers of Mrs. Dalloway that you're able to see, Clarissa Dalloway, automatically. You know, honestly, when you start correcting, when you know when you have those right questions in your net exam, there'll be a sense of achievement that yes, you've learned it, you've, you've understood the work well. You'll be really proud of your own self and your abilities. So always keep that in mind, all right? Always just remember that because a lot of times it's something that you forget very often, but you'll be very happy. Uh, getting those answers right, getting those answers right altogether. Okay, moving on. How does Gregor die in Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis after being transformed into an insect? After being transformed into an insect. Sure, Rupesh. Thank you so much, Pachi. I'm not going to be stressed about, uh, you know, the shift which Rupesh is going to be giving because I'm sure he'll be able to, like, he's a very diligent child, will give me a very accurate update altogether. 
Uh, Asha, the, the email ID is there at the top, nisha.raheja at the read .co, not com, but co, okay? Right, what is the right answer over here? <clears throat> what is the right answer over here, everyone? This is the 27th question that you're having. D is absolutely the right answer, out of starvation, okay? He dies. So how does Gregor die? Gregor dies out of starvation. Gregor is actually dying out of starvation. You're able to see that Gregor is dying out of starvation. Please keep that in mind. Out of starvation, Gregor is dying. Okay, uh, the first part is narrated from the perspectives of which of the following characters in William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. The first part is narrated from the perspective of which of the following characters in Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. Very good, Abantika. Many, many congratulations. All the students who've, who've qualified uh, West Bengal set, many congratulations and kudos to you. I'm really glad to see that, right? I, I will probably have to, uh, you know, go over the chat box where a lot of you have written. Many, many congratulations. <coughs> Sorry. Right, right, right. Absolutely right. Benjamin Benzi Compson. The first part is narrated from the perspective of Benzi Compson. The first part is narrated from the the perspective of Benzi Compson. Benzi Compson. That is what you're able to see over here. Benzi Compson. The sound and the fury. So it is set in Jefferson, Missouri. It's telling you about it's coming in four narratives. Uh, Benzi's narrative is, is, of course, there the 33-year-old disabled person who's coming in. Right? So it is Benzi Compson that you're able to largely see and check about. Okay? Or right, let's move on uh, to the next question that you are having. Let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer for this particular question. The protagonist of F. Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby is associated with which of the following businesses? Is associated with which of the following businesses? So sweet of you, Aziz. That's very, very sweet of you. So Aziz, Bantika, I think there was one more student who mentioned right now in the live chat only. Many congratulations for clearing the West Bengal set exam. And, and keep the success going in the net exam as well. The protagonist of F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, is associated with which of the following businesses? Pleasure. Pleasure, Bantika. Uh, so all very nice. Uh, bootlegging. Bootlegging, right? Is associated with bootlegging. Okay? Bootlegging. Okay, Simran, noted. Bootlegging is the right answer over here. Bootlegging is absolutely the right answer. Most of you have answered it correctly. Bootlegging is something which the great Gatsby's business is associated with, right? <coughs> Sorry. Okay, moving on to the next question that we are having. Moving on in James Joyce, Modernist Masterpiece, Ulysses, which is divided into 18 episodes. Which of the following episodes dwells into discussion on the Jews? It is dwelling on to the discussion of the Jews. Yes, definitely, Aziz, definitely, all of you. You know, I, I, I so, so that is one of the <clears throat> most important a uh, delightful shift of, of being uh, a person, you know, when you're mentoring. So rather, I don't think I would have ever prayed for my exams as much as I pray for all of you. So please just shine bright and, and be very successful because your success makes us the happiest, right? What is the right answer over here? It is divided into, so in James Joyce Modernist Masterpiece, which is divided into 18 episodes, which is the following episodes is telling you about discussion on the Jews. So we are able to see that episode two on Nestor, episode two on Nestor, very nice, very nice, Simran, touch board, keep the confidence alive and be very patient and answer the questions correctly. Right, uh, episode two, Nestor, that is where we are able to see, right? That is where predominantly we are able to see the reference the reference is there uh, of, of uh, the discussion on Jews, as you are able to see in this particular work, right? There is a reference which is there. Uh, because we were doing Afro-American writings, I'll, I'll just cover one more question. I'll just cover one more question because we were talking about Afro-American literature. So I'll just cover this one question more. And then probably we'll pause over here. Uh, on the 31st question, we'll pause over here. Tomorrow, I will cover a few important pointers back to back, right? We will uh, discuss a few pointers back to back. But let's see how many of you. Which of the following characters is a blind poet and a storyteller in Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man? <clears throat> Thank you. 
Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Here, here you're able to see Revero, uh, Reverend Homer A. Barbie. So the blind poet and storyteller is Reverend Homer A. Barbie. Homer A. Barbie, right? Homer A. Barbie. So, so uh, that is that is absolutely the right answer. Invisible Men by Ralph Ellison is an important work that you're able to see, particularly in Afro-American writings. Um, and, and critical race theory is something that all of you should ideally be more aware about, okay? Uh, that is where a lot of your uh, questions are actually concentrated. Do you want to give five more questions before we leave or are you tired or do you want to rest and then, you know, be prepared for your exam day after? How do you want to proceed? Do you want to do five more questions? Uh, let me know if you if you want to do five more questions. We can actually continue doing five more questions or otherwise we can call it a day today and then we can continue. <clears throat> Okay, Sushmita is saying. Okay, right, then let's let's do quickly five more questions. Let's just do five more questions. Uh, Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel, Brave New World, is set in futuristic world of. It is set in the futuristic world of. Sorry. Nice, Tuti. It is set in the futuristic world of. It is set in the futuristic world of. The world state, the world state, right? It's set in the futuristic world of the world state. So Aldous Huxley's dystopian work, The Brave New World, it's set in the futuristic world of the world state, right? In the world state, the futuristic world altogether, okay? The futuristic world altogether, that is where we are able to see that this particular work is actually set, right? This, this particular work is actually set, B, the world state, the world state altogether. That is what you are able to see. Uh, which of the following is not a theme of Evelyn was wild things? Evelyn was wild things. Is not a theme of Evelyn was wild things. Wild things. <clears throat> wild things. Wild things. Is not a theme. Is not a theme. So only American political policies, only American political policies is something which is being discussed. Love, decadence, post-war one society is not being discussed. Only American political policies. The American political policies is something that Evelyn Waugh is actually looking at. Right. So Evelyn was Wild Bodies. The original title was Bring Young Things. Oh, sorry, Bright Young Things. Um, and you are able to see that it's not dealing with any of the other remaining ones. Right. It's only dealing with American political policies. It's primarily dealing with American political policies. That is the major agenda. <clears throat> Book three of Ernest Hemingway's Farewell to Arm is set against the World War Battles, the World War Battles, the World War Battles, the World War Battle of Caporetto, the World War Battle of Caporetto, the World War Battle of Caporetto, the World War Battle of Caporetto. So please keep that in mind that the World War Battle of Caporetto is something which is at the backdrop, right? Caporetto is, is at the backdrop that you're largely able to see. Caporetto is the backdrop that you're largely able to look at, okay? So please remember that. <clears throat> Okay, which of the following themes is not associated with Joseph Heller's novel Catch-22? Joseph Heller's novel Catch-22, which is not associated with Joseph Heller's work Catch-22, which is not associated with Joseph Heller's book Catch-22, which theme is not associated with Keller's Catch-22? Uh, Catch Catch-22. Not, okay, look at the question, not also. Paradox, morality, bureaucracy, mental health. So, so again, you have to choose the code wisely, right? You have to basically choose the code wisely. All of these are not associated, <coughs> right? All of these are actually not associated. All of these are not associated. So even when you cover American writings, 20th century American writings, most of these works will actually be covered altogether, Right. Most of these writings will actually be covered altogether. You will be able to read them entirely end to end. Sorry, you will be able to get a better idea. What is the name of the totalitarian state in William S. Barrow's 1959 novel, The Naked Lunch? What is the name of the totalitarian state in William S. Barrow's The Naked Lunch? The totalitarian state? What is it called? <clears throat> 
What is a totalitarian state called? It's called annexia. What is a totalitarian state called? The totalitarian state is basically called as annexia, right? Uh, the, the totalitarian state is called as annexia. Annexia is the name of the totalitarian state which is coming in. Okay, uh, what I'll do is I will pause over here. I will pause over here. Uh, but what I want essentially all of you to do, uh, what I want all of you to, uh, to certainly, you know, make sure all of you are looking at, all of you will be uh, reviewing right now at this particular juncture. What I want all of you to do is I really want all of you to make sure that you, uh, you know, you review, first of all, keep your confidence levels high. There's absolutely no need for you to worry about it. Uh, whatever handwritten notes you've been looking at, try to revisit them. If possible, do a complete mock, at least one complete mock of both paper one and paper two. Uh, just make sure that you're revising the concepts of paper one, because a lot of times, you know, as English students, you go wrong with those questions also, which I don't really want you to actually go wrong with um also what i would really um, want all of you to do is i would really want all of you to also strategize make a note of the topics that you think that you know uh, you you aren't really uh, being able to complete so that you know you you are better prepared if in case you are, you are attempting for any other exam or you know for the next attempt altogether so just uh, make sure and like I said, you will have to keep your spirits very, very positive because at this juncture, it looks like, oh, you've not done anything. It looks as if like, you know, uh, it's too late uh, or or you're forgetting everything. But if you lose your positivity, the, the game's almost going to be lost altogether. So being positive is going to be essential. It's going to be of paramount importance, right? And like I said, if anybody wants to share their analysis, uh, that is for the first March of March paper, the net analysis, please feel free to mail us your name, your contact details, along with the shift that you are, uh, you are appearing. Is it a morning shift or an evening shift? And your contact details are important. Your number is important. Your mobile number is important. Uh, just let us know about it, okay? <laughs> That's so sweet of you. That's so sweet of you. I'm so sorry. Just let us know about... Uh, uh, that and and tomorrow I will just cross check with the team and we'll make sure that you know we are able to get a session organized at six o'clock. Best of luck for your preparation. I'm sure most of you will nail the exam. Just make sure that you have that calmness, that composure, that peace of mind when you're going to be giving the exam. Okay, all the very best. Keep shining brightly, and I'll catch up with all.